There is one rule in Factorio, and it is the factory must grow. And I think my brother and I kind of did this with our 1000 science per minute factory. So to go through our world tour, we're going to break it down into four different sections. There's our IKEA warehouse, where everything is crafted for building. Taste the sun, which is our mega solar field for energy to fuel it. Hopefully not Chernobyl, which is our nuclear reactor array which is also electricity for our mega factory, labeled Why No Steel, because it's always out. And this is where all the magic happens and all the 1000 science is done per minute. Even though it's at 940 right now, but you know, efficiency and stuff, but we round up to 1000. So starting at IKEA Warehouse, this is actually where we started our death world at, because making 1000 science per minute factory do it in a peaceful world? Nah. Do it in a death world where there's a ton of aliens everywhere? Yeah, that, that's what we did. So up here are the ore patches that we started with. Iron is completely gone. Copper is looking a little bit bare. And all the way at the top is our first nuclear reactor, which was a Hail Mary attempt to save our factory when the boilers run off of coal weren't enough to sustain the factory. And moving on down our IKEA warehouse, to our left is the different crafting places for all the sciences. Because this was our first factory that just made us limp along and get our rocket to launch to technically beat the death world. Which we did eventually do as we make our way down here past purple science, all the blue chips churning out, and to our rocket. So we limped along and barely survived in our small factory right here with a solar field which kept us going and like stated earlier, the nuclear reactor and that was enough at the time. And then we just repurposed it with the logistics network to have random crafting stations like right here is a blue chip production, all the mortars you could ever possibly need, and just some kind of random stuff like train supplies, spider trons and their different upgrades, fighter robots, and nuclear equipment. And then of course other random places like producing a ton of concrete because you do use a lot of that, and almost depleted entirely a stone patch just for landfill because we decided to make this world kind of a lot of water so we can cut it off and that kind of bit us a little bit but landfill eventually gets produced whenever you have a whole stone patch being fed into one assembler and we had to tear down a few of our walls to make room for the new factory but this is what our old walls used to look like where there were turrets fed by magazines with laser turrets and then of course flamethrowers because those are goaded and necessary for surviving. So anything that you want to remark about this area before we move on Evan? No, there's nothing much to add. That's pretty much it. Okay, and this world is kind of a little bit big so we're just gonna make our way over to the solar field. And honestly the solar field was a stupid desire of mine like any game that has solar in it I just feel obligated that it's just you gotta build it all a stupid amount and when I say a stupid amount like the sheer amount of solar panels here and accumulators it is a ridiculous amount let's get an actual number for that and take a blueprint of all this I'll eventually get to the bottom corner 39,000 solar panels and 33,000 accumulators so needless to say, with all these solar panels and accumulators, you can definitely taste the sun. And if you look at our power statistics, our solar panels are producing 1.7 gigawatts of the 7.7 .7 total. So it's a decent amount. It's enough to get along. And actually at their peak, they produce 2.4 gigawatts. So they're just kind of a safeguard in case something were to go wrong with the nuclear reactor, which it has gone wrong with it before, that it just picks up the slack and saves us from being destroyed. Because our boundary between the biters and our base is just a row of five laser turrets. And they kind of use electricity, and if that goes down, biters have a heyday. 
So now moving down to the hopefully not Chernobyl incident where it produces most of the power for our mega factory because honestly whenever you have the amount of beacons that are in it, it takes a lot of power. So I'm going to let you kind of describe what you want to on this area Evan because you were the one that built this. I was addicted to solar panels and you were down here actually producing power efficiently. Yeah, so this design was basically built so it was infinitely tileable. So we could expand it in either direction just by removing the underground belts here on this side and just building off to the side. As long as you have water that you're able to uh, feed in from the ends. So as long as you have a big enough pond, you can just keep making it grow. It's pretty close to ratio, but it works ideally. Like we could make it infinitely tileable on land if we had the water fed in with trains but that's just a whole nother problem trains are trains are a mess but it works the best if you can just feed it in directly from the water it has to travel less distance but currently we have 44 reactors plus the four on top but then over here where we're making the fuel there was just one belt that wasn't facing the right direction that caused the whole thing to go down. This one belt right here is turned away from the inserter, so it prioritized grabbing the uh, the uranium-235 on the left side of the belt. So what it was doing was it was prioritizing using the uranium we were getting from the Covarex processing instead of this, the uranium coming from the uh, initial processing from the mine, from the raw. So it backed up and we had no uranium-238 coming in to be turned into fuel. So just by turning this one belt, it prioritizes using the stuff on the right. So I believe now that's daylight, we can see the true glory of our energy production. Okay, yeah, we're sitting at 9.9 .9 gigawatts. Of course, beacons are taking up about half of what it needs to be satisfied. Speaking of beacons, we can move to our actual mega factory that does all the magic. So we talked about how the electricity is produced, and as you can see, it is train-fed, our mega factory. So of course, we have two copper patches over here, a coal, another copper, and then some crude oil being tapped, and then an iron patch down here, and then over on the other side, there's our stone patch to feed into it, another iron patch, and an iron patch here, and then all the way over here, another iron patch, because as you can see by the factory's name, we were not getting enough steel and that's because there was not enough iron but now that is fixed and from all those trains they take the resources run down the line all the way to where they are drawn off of the belts so here is the crude oil being tanked off the coal iron here copper on this side another copper dispersal stone iron taking all the resources they're dispersed into the factory the coal being for the oil processing the iron over here for plates two copper inputs for copper plates the stone and then this iron input over here for steel which always seem to be the crux of our factory. With those raw resources, they are taken and dispersed to do their individual crafting for sciences, having the max productivity modules surrounded by all the beacons with speed three modules. So that's the general idea on how the factory works. And it's just putting the belts where it transports the supplies. And I guess is there something that you want to talk about the factory since you were the one who mainly designed the factory and how it worked. Yeah, so mentioned previously in another video up in the oil refinery, we have a circuit up here to make sure it doesn't get deadlocked. So we use that same circuit over here to make sure that we had equal amounts of all the three different fluids and we minimized the distance that the fluids had to travel by keeping them all in the same area and the only other fluid used, or two actually, sulfuric acid for the blue chips was kept nearby, as well as lubricant for the motors 
the electric engines. So those were all kept nearby so that way we didn't have extra belts running the fluids across the factory. All these uh, balancers we were just uh, from a circuit or a, a blueprint book we found online to help us. Somebody else did the crazy math to figure out what needed to be done so we just use their work to make our lives easier um because yeah honestly looking at this balancer like i don't know what's going on i just know it works somehow then churning out all the green circuits over here and the red circuits you can see the belts just completely puking out a ton of materials like it's kind of unfathomable whenever you just see them all on the ground and it's like these are all being used in like one minute and all the science through its different crafting operations is brought down this way and the rockets there are two separate silos where they're loaded with their rocket control units the low density and the rocket fuel and the satellite is crafted down here as well and all the science is funneled into a similar beacon set up for the assemblers where max productivity in the machines and speed modules all around them with the science being on half of the belt so that all of it can be exposed to all the labs. And you do that on a massive scale where it can barely fit in my screen and you got a ton of science per minute. This factory really only utilizes a third of these at any given point when it, in, in theory, if it's running correctly, but by making it larger than it needs to be, we have a buffer built up as we're trying to debug and find out what problems are going on that helps it catch back up. Or if we're off plane with the biters, it also gives us time if we don't have research in the queue to, to not lose too much of the time because we have the facilities to use up all the stored research fairly quickly. So yeah, looking at it from an aerial view, you can see the chunks right next to the train outputs. All of those are just pure smelting units, just for the raw resources. And there's not really that many crafting units. It's a bunch of just smelters and not too many crafting units to achieve this factory. Now I'm gonna take a blueprint of all this because I'm honestly curious how much resourcage this factory took to build. Oh, that is a beautiful factory right there. So technically we could build another one if you wanted to, Evan. I mean, that's the whole point. You blueprint it and make it grow. If you have to think about it, I have the statistics up here. What do you think is the most used item in this factory? Um, Beat modules. Nope, it's express belts. And they're three times more than the speed modules. There's 41,000 express belts, 14,000 speed three. Oh, and don't even get me started on underground belts. Those are the worst thing to craft for a mega factory. And only 7.3k beacons. Honestly, that's all that I thought of for covering about the factory, the gist of how it worked, the key four locations. Of course, there's our fun mortar setups that are also train fed to obliterate the biters. In this death world, I'd say we definitely conquered it over and over again with the fun challenges we did on the last few episodes. And the settings for this death world were definitely amplified all the way up. We had a few failed attempts because we amplified it up too much past the standard definition of a death world, but I think we found that happy medium that was challenging and a fun factory to build. It took about four months real life to do this and 173 hours according to the achievements log. Unless you think of anything else, there's one last thing that we've been holding off doing. I don't think so. I mean, we've, we've improved our lasers. We've improved our capacity of death robots to follow us. What, what's left? Oh, right. It's that small, dinky little steel axe upgrade to mine by hand because you know we do a ton of that now so we can just queue that up can... behind the productivity 25 and just wait for that to tick over because it's gonna get done stupid fast and i guess one last look at the statistics we can look at our kill statistics you can see that there was a few great purges that we had of the aliens near the beginning they took out a ton of our things, like 1.3k laser turrets. That's quite a few. Oh, shoot. That's always a fun thing to look at. Pollution. Pollution is just 
it's just a fact. That's just a, it's a natural force at this point in this world. The biters just accept it and make their little riots. In hindsight, if we won a solid 1,000 science per minute, I would have designed it again with 10% more of everything. Oh, oh that was a flash. <laughs> it's already gone. But yeah, like, we, like you were saying, over-design the factory so that we meet our goal since inefficiencies are inevitable. It's easier to design for more room and dial back than to try to squeeze stuff in. But that's also part of the game, trying to squeeze more in. I feel like we've squeezed as much as we can out of this world, did everything that Factorial really has to offer, and with that, I'd say we can sign off for one last time. This death world was a fun endeavor I'm glad to have endured with my brother and have shared with all of you. We went from mere puppets for the biters to play with to their demonic overlords conducting evil experiments on them. But sadly, with this video comes the end of our Factorio series. Factorio is a game about progress and always moving forward to make the factory better. That's what our world shows on the outside. But ultimately, having a 1000 science per minute factory means nothing. What I will cherish is the time I spent with my brother and the countless failures that make us both grin ear to ear as we finally remember our factory in the stars on an alien planet meant for death. Mm -hmm.